Uh, your wedding, My fe- wedding featured an interesting best man. Dylan, can we the, bring up the picture? Of the best, best man. The, Dylan's best, best man that. here. There you go. Uh, <laughs> that was he was he was truly my best man, yeah. and uh, that's Monroe, uh-huh. and named after the county you grew up in. Named after the county I grew up in, absolutely. And he is looking extra handsome today, thanks to the next guest, who made him his little cufflinks <laughs> and bow tie. I did. I did. <laughs> and and I shared and I like shared with Rob had, and Bill. They even have like the, the, cu- the actual cufflinks too. I think yes, maybe yeah. yes. He, he was. Yeah. You can see them. And a, yeah. And a and a wingtip collar with a bow tie, and I made that specific specifically for Monroe. And yeah. it was fa- and, well, and I got a tux as well. But yeah, he did. <laughs> <laughs> He he wore his way better than, than I did. He looks I good. He does. he does. He looks good. He's he's a handsome fella, and oh, that's um, sweet. he looks hot. Though. <laughs> he loves. He loves. He he's very happy about the the choice that I made in, in marriage. Yeah, yeah. and uh, he loves Sarah very much. Especially that's, that's because baby now. he gets adventure every day when you open the door and something flies in. He gets to chase it. Absolutely. Yeah, like a bat or a, <laughs> yeah, a bird. Bad bird, whatever. <laughs> he clearly um, loved his attire because the video that you sent us last night, he I'll was, show that he, one to you. He was it's, strutting. Right, right, right. Oh, and yeah. the, the video that I shared, Dana, if you remember, I, and maybe you don't because it's been, it's been nine like, years ago you know, yeah. or so, is when he when he first started walking, he was like kicking his legs real <laughs> funny. Like, yeah. Yeah, and, no, um, I didn't see that. You have to send that to me. We'll put it on our Facebook page. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we do all kinds of crazy things at Dana's Tuxedo. Our guest is Dana Knowles. In case you haven't figured that part out yet, Dana, good morning. Good morning. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for having me. Thank Absolutely. You for reaching out. Yeah, give, go ahead and give Dana's Tux a plug there. Okay, Dana's Tuxedo, 310 Wilson Street in Martinsburg. We've been in business since 2008. I think we're up to 15,370 some tuxedos that we've rented. So we Whoa. know what we're doing. We're good at room. what we do, and that's all we do. Our motto is we want you to be reasonably comfortable, but extremely handsome. I like that motto. And if you mention you heard uh, Dana on Talk Radio WRNR's Eastern Panhandle Talk, she will also outfit your dog with the latest in dog cufflinks and uh, uh-huh. bow ties. Yes, I will. <laughs> For a reasonable price. Absolutely. Yeah, how about your cat? Do you do cats? Sure. Sure. Oh, can you we'll imagine a room. cat trying to put cufflinks on Way a cat? Too sure, we can no. do that. Way too aloof. Way too Anything's possible. Uh, Anything's possible. You, you are an author now. I am an author. Dana's- Last time I was here, I was an inventor. Yes. How'd that, by the way, it's are, still are you still great. selling? Yep, still selling. We the got Shower the, Caddy uh, or something? Over, we just hit 800 five-star reviews on Amazon. Shower Caddy, still doing right. great. That's great. Yep. Well, congratulations Thank to you, you as an inventor. Do you have another product in the pipeline? I have a lot of products in the pipeline, but I have so much going on that I can't focus. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like a ball in a pinball machine. Boing, boing, boing. I'm all over the place. So, but yeah. Including yeah. being an author, yeah. the uh, the pause method, P.A.U.S.E. Dylan's going to slide that over so everybody in our audience can see on TV as well. Uh, so you can see what the cover of the book looks like. Tell me about this story. So the pause method, pause actually stands for postpone action until serenity emerges. And I had to put it in there like that's not a typo because serenity is serenity and sanity merged together. Mm -hmm. It's one word. And um, so the reason that I wrote the book is uh, it's no big secret I'm in recovery. I've been clean and sober for 25 years. Mm -hmm. That's that's an accomplishment. (laughs) Yeah, seeing that life gets thrown at you, whether you get sober or not, you know, and it's how do you not drink or put something in your body to dull the pain, you know, and you learn how to do that over time. And and through the years, I've met a lot of wonderful people and told them bits and pieces about my past story prior to getting sober. And over and over, I kept hearing, you need to write a book. You need to write a book. Like, to me, my story is just my story. Mm -hmm. Um, It's just the way I live my life. And so I had one particular gentleman, Stephen Key, um, and he's, he was, became a mentor to me in the inventing world, and he knew a little bit about me, and he said, you need to write a book. you got a powerful story to tell. So in November of 20, where are we at, 2023, 2021, I put my first word on paper, and I just started writing. And so the book is um, a memoir. The ha- first half of the book is a memoir of my story of – you know, where I came from, how I got into drugs and alcohol, where the drugs and alcohol took me. It took me down a very, very dark 
path. I'm not going to tell people what path that was. I want people to read the book. Mm -hmm. I don't want to spoil alert it for them. And then um, how I landed in treatment and being homeless and then uh, a little bit of how I, how I got sober and how I started to recreate my life. And then the second half of the book is all about the pause. And each chapter, one is postponed, one is action until the serenity emerges. So there's different chapters. And I tell stories of how the pause is so important, when I did pause, when I didn't pause. I wrote a whole chapter on the word until. How do you even do that, right? Um, and so, but it's really about learning how to deal with people, places, and things that are out of our control and how to differentiate you're crazy from everybody else is crazy. So the book uh, just came out. It, and I did an Audible version, too. And where I can did, you get the book? Amazon. Anywhere local? No, it's not in any bookstores local. Okay, so do it on Amazon. Amazon, primarily. I have to buy, you know, 100 copies and go spread them out to different bookstores around to get some traction. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, but I did my own Audible as well. Because it's very, I've had people read it and said that they were crying through it, that they were laughing through it. So I did not want to hire somebody to do my own Audible because it's my story. I have to tell it. Mm -hmm. And even parts of the story, you can tell I'm getting kind of, you know, emotional, like a little choked up or I'm laughing. And it's, there's a lot of emotion and a lot of um, cliffhangers in it and things like that. So it's a, it's a kind of an up and down story. It's a small read. It's 100 pages. I'm always interested pages. in uh, what was the breaking point that brought you to trying to stop one lifestyle and start another one? Um, I remember it like it was yesterday. 25 years, 25 and a half years ago, it was September 3rd. I had went to a house, I was I had my own cleaning business, and I went to a house, and it was just like any other day. Now, I'm full-blown alcohol, alcohol and drugs. I mean, I can't live, like, I cannot live without putting booze into my body because I'm going to go into detox. And for whatever reason, that morning, I, I didn't have anything to drink, and I was in full-blown detox, shaking, sweating, nauseous, um, and I knew that what would fix it was go get a drink. And I went to the, I went to the bar, and I put the booze in my mouth, and it went down my throat and hit my belly, and I went into an instant blackout. Uh, blackouts are when you're awake, you're moving, you're, you're driving, you're talking, but when you come out of the blackout, you have no recollection of what happened. And it was 18 hours later when I came out of my blackout. And I was in a strange house with strange people. I didn't know where I was at. And that had happened to me many, many times before, but I don't know what time, what was different about this time. I was so sickened in my soul at what I had become because I had good morals and I had good values. And I wanted to be a good person, but booze and drugs, I couldn't. It wouldn't allow me to. And that was the point that I reached out. I wasn't very, I wasn't a godly person or a religious person by far. God and I, I always say God and I had a little deal. You leave me alone, I'll leave you alone, we'll be fine. Mm -hmm. And that morning, I cried out to God for help. And that's all I could say. That good old, they call it the alcoholic prayer. God help me. Mm -hmm. And I called a local treatment center. And I didn't, I didn't know that I wanted to get sober because I didn't know what sober was. I hadn't drawn a sober breath in 20 years, maybe even more. And um, I, found, I thought I was crazy. I thought I needed to be locked up. I thought there was seriously something mentally wrong with me. And really, it was just I was, I was an alcoholic. And they cleaned me up. I was in rehab for 21 days, and I realized that if I don't put booze in my body and other drugs, other mind-altering chemicals, that I can pretty much function like any other person. But also coming into recovery at 35 years old and having the mentality of a 15-year-old, that's the hard part. Because while you're in treatment, it's great. There's nothing around you to get high or to drink, and then you have to go out into the real world and you have to see the commercials and you have to walk, drive past the bars. And so I surrounded myself with a lot of good people that were in recovery to help me start and create my life. So you are an absolutely incredible person to talk to and, and, a, <laughs> and a, a model of what can happen and how you can get out of what has happened. Mm -hmm. you, you're an author, you're an inventor, you're a business owner. You probably had none of those thoughts or aspirations while you were using and, and throughout your addiction. And the fact that you're now clean, you're sober, you have a story to tell. But 
the one thing you relied upon after uh, you made a strong decision to follow God and use that as support, but you also, I'm sure, had lots of support from your community to help you through your trials and tribulations. Absolutely. If I wouldn't have had the support from people in the recovery world, I would have never, I would have never been able to do that. But I also had support with people outside the recovery world. There was one particular gentleman, Mark Sarno. Um, I was working for him, which is comes back to the tuxedo business because I worked for Sarno and Sons, which is up in Scranton, Pennsylvania, one of the largest tuxedo suppliers in the Northeastern United States. And uh, I, I was working for him one day and in treatment the next. I never said, hey, goodbye, I'm going to treatment. In fact, the morning I woke up in treatment, I kind of said, oh, well, I won't say what I said, but it was like, oh man, I really screwed up now. You know, I've destroyed my life. I'm in treatment now. And, and uh, Mark Sarno, uh, reached out to me, somehow got a message to me and said, what can I do for you? He had had a friend that died of, uh, of alcoholism and he said, I don't want that to happen to you. And he gave me my job back. And that was the first person, non-recovery person that believed in me. And then I've had so many people in my life. But, you know, for, for me, it was like, I wanted the help. I needed the help. I knew I wanted to get sober. I knew I wanted to get clean. And there were so many people out there that wanted to help me that I had to allow them to help me. You had to realize that you weren't alone. Yeah. And one thing that you had said about, I reached out to God on that day, but I look at it like it, it, there's powers greater than me out there, and I had to rely on it. I, I'm still not a real religious person. I don't attend church. Um, I go to 12-step meetings, um, and that's kind of like I can of talk like to my, you after a while, after the show's yeah. off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's probably not going to happen. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I found my own, my own God of my understanding, and... Um, and it seems to work for me. It's worked for 25 and a half years, so I'm going to kind of continue doing that. But, um, yeah, it's, it's really that there's help out there. People can get help, and they can change. Now, I never in a million years thought that I would be where I am today, the first lady of Martinsburg, West Virginia. That blows my mind. Yeah. because, And this is one of the reasons I wrote the book, too. I lived this other life, and it seems to me like it's this dirty little secret that nobody knows about my who I was before and I live in this internal fear that people are really going to find out who I was and this is a way to bring it to the light and put it out there and if you love me you love me if you hate me you hate me oh well but I've I like for instance I was at a chamber of our uh, rotary dinner last night and I still f I feel like I don't fit in with people and maybe other people feel that way too but this is a way for me to bring this all out because I don't have a great education I don't work for a big corporation I don't have all these accolades behind my behind me so I always kind of feel less than and so this is just a way for me to bring my past out into the light let people know me for who I am and then I don't have to walk around with that internal fear that maybe somebody might find out Interesting. We talked earlier before, right before the show started that the addiction is so easy mm -hmm. to, to acquire oh, yeah. and to become addicted, but the recovery part is the hardest. Mm -hmm. um, but through support, it is accomplishable. Mm -hmm. You can do it, mm -hmm. but you can't do it alone. Right. You have to have others. Right. You, have, you have an incredible husband that is very supportive of our, know, our program at the health department, mm -hmm. and I'm so thankful for that and the, and the rest of the council. But we can't do it alone, mm -mm. and mm -mm. neither can those that have the addictions. They can't overcome that alone. And something that's interesting is if you're not <clears> – <throat> if you've never struggled with an alcohol or drug addiction, you don't understand, period. That's why – in the twelve-step meetings, it's one recover, one alcoholic or addict talking to another one. Where instead of me saying, "Well, you should do this and you should do this and you should do this," I'm sharing my story with you, and you're relating to me and seeing how far I've come, and then maybe you know they can come along. And there's a lot of people that I help along the way in the recovery world just by sharing my story. So I'm Remember. hoping sharing my story here in the book will yeah. certainly. Um, and again, the book is called The Pause Method, mm -hmm. and that's by Dana Knowles, our guest on the program this P morning. P A U S E, not not P A W S. No, not, not a dog. No, yeah. not a dog. I know you're in the dog. Place, I know, but no, not a dog. Um, so, I, just I want to talk about the process of you putting pen to paper mm -hmm. and kind of reliving some of those experiences mm -hmm. that you had previous in your life, and the um, if that. 
could have been a trigger for someone who hasn't who wasn't as grounded as you are in your recovery I don't understand the question so you have to you have to go back and talk about these mm -hmm. terrible things that, mm -hmm. that that affected your life mm -hmm. is could that possibly trigger wanting to go have another drink or go have a drug for me or, yeah or, or looking back on it and with some nostalgia even yeah no I you know I don't I can't say I don't think about drinking. Yeah, I think about it. Last night they were having champagne. At the, everybody was toasting. And, you know, sometimes I feel like, man, why did I, why can't I enjoy just a little glass of champagne with everybody? But through writing the book, it, it didn't trigger anything with, with to go back and drink or drug or anything like that. But the emotions that came through it, that came out of me while I was, while I was writing and how I wrote my book is because I'm, I'm, you know, not a good typer. I just read it out loud on Microsoft Word and I just stood sat in front of my computer and I just talked. And, t and then I went in and cleaned it up and cleaned it up. And there was times that I, that I was crying when I talk about certain things, you know, that being molested when I was a child and being all alone. And that's kind of where, where my journey started, you know, and I think that's a common denominator in people who are in, who, who go down that path is something bad happened. And I was a child, I was 12 years old, and you know, back then in the 1970s or 60s, it, 70s it would have been, you know, nobody talked about that. Um, but while I was writing the book, it was more emotion that was coming out of the pain and letting the tears out. Um, and if I'm getting emotional about it, I know other people who read it are gonna get emotional about it. Cause I'm not unique. I mean, everybody's been through, not everybody, but many people have been through what I've been through with their, with having a loving mother and father and then going down a bad path and knowing you shouldn't be doing it and the guilt and the shame and then the spiral out of control and knowing you shouldn't be doing it and then drinking more to, to numb the feelings and then going out and do bad behavior and then, you wake up the next morning and oh my gosh, I can't believe I did that. And that it's like this big spiral and um, you know, some people take it to death. What, I was lucky. Was it therapeutic was in the, in the end? I think it was, I, this is more therapeutic right now, getting it out there, mm -hmm. talking about it. That well, is, let me just say you belong. I do. You belong. <laughs> you, you can go to any rotary, you belong, any meeting you belong. Well, You're was, good enough. A few years ago, I got an award from, Oh, what's the church? I'm sorry, I can't. But it was a love and lead award for good. And, and somebody invited me to go to this dinner. And I thought, oh, I'll go. And they were real forceful about me going to this dinner. And they were giving these awards. And the awards were, oh, this person went to college. And this person is this. And this person is that. And then, then they called my name. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, what are they going to say about me? Oh, she was a drug addict and alcoholic and ruined her. Like, she was a tornado going through people's lives. And... Um, and I guess, you know, it's all, but people, people do realize that we do good works, even if we don't think we do, you know, and, and I have a lot to say, and I have a lot to share. And I have, a, I have, I just want to bring the, the, all the bad things that happened to me, I want to bring it under the light and so that I can be a power force for people in recovery or for, for people who are struggling, and, not and even pe people in recovery. And people who have addictions and struggling doesn't necessarily mean that they're, ho you, you talked about being homeless. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily no. mean you're homeless, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that you have no money, that you, that you're living on the streets. Right. It right. can affect those that are, are, are professionals, yep. attorneys, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. any, it, all walks of life, mm -hmm. that it's not just geared for those that are on their last leg. Right. The book is called The Pause Method, P-A-U-S-E, written by Dana Knowles, Five Steps to Be More at Peace with Yourself and the World You Live In. It is her story, and you can get it at Amazon uh, right now, The Pause Method.